Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's nice to see you here tonight. You can tell I'm rubbing my hands. I'm cold. It's my hope that Jamaica Kincaid will bring a little of Antigua's wonderful weather to us. I'm not holding my breath, though. Of course, we're very pleased to welcome Jamaica Kincaid here tonight. Uh, she comes to us from California, which not that unlike Antigua. Uh, and, and we're pleased to be able to host her tonight in concert with our Diversity Council and our Visiting Writers Series. And I know that both uh, have greatly anticipated her coming. As always, I want to thank the English Bonner Mitchell Foundation, who have been loyal to us these many years, and our media sponsors, Wayne TV, News Channel 15, and Northeast Indiana Public Radio. It's, it's great that they're willing to sponsor us as well. As usual, there'll be a question and answer period after the lecture. Um, I hope we've all learned from the tutorial that there are microphones up on the second level. Please use them so that everybody can hear your questions. Uh, it works out a lot better that way. And, and please try to keep questions short so that we can accommodate as many of folks as want to ask questions as possible. After the lecture, uh, Ms. Kincaid will be uh, signing books in the, in the outer lobby, again, as usual. And uh, I know she, she's incredibly gracious. She's a, a wonderful guest to have here. And to introduce her tonight, let me introduce Sophie Glazer from our English department. Sophie teaches English literature, so it's a, a completely appropriate introductory speaker. Sophie. What a pleasure it is to be here to welcome Jamaica Kincaid. It has been more than 25 years since I first discovered Jamaica Kincaid with uh, the publication of Annie John, one of her earliest books. In Annie John, she invited us into an astonishing and heartbreaking love affair, the tender, rapturous love of mother and child. In it, she describes the bliss, the Edenic purity, of that love, the sensuous intimacy of that relationship. What happens to that love, the love of mother and child, when the child becomes a woman? On one level, of course, we all know about this. We know the grim calculus of sexual competition. We've read the fairy tales that show us that terrible moment when a beautiful woman looks into a mirror and discovers that she's no longer the fairest of them all. What Jamaica Kincaid showed us in Annie John was the other side of the mirror, the opposite side of that story. The little girl gazing into the mirror and seeing with dismay, with horror even, that she is no longer the beloved child that she used to be. The transformation is so sudden it's almost comic. My nose had suddenly spread across my face, almost blotting out my cheeks, taking up my whole face so that if I didn't know I was me standing there, I would have wondered about that strange girl. And to think that only so recently my nose had been a small thing, the size of a rosebud. But what could I do? What can she do? Jamaica Kincaid's readers followed her adventures through all sorts of fictional incarnations. In Lucy, she was a scornful, embittered Antiguan expatriate, contemptuously rejecting an American friend, an older woman who wants to instill in her a love of flowers, of daffodils particularly. Wretched daffodils, the young girl calls them. But disquietingly enough, at the same time that Lucy was disparaging the daffodils, we were reading Jamaica Kincaid's lovely gardening essays in The New Yorker, enchanting celebrations of flowers, invitations to discover in each flower a whole world of associations. It was as if she had stepped through the mirror to become the older woman, surrounded by daffodils, at the same time that she stood on the other side of the glass, despairing at the loss of her rosebud nose. I spoke of discovering Jamaica Kincaid, but one essential point she has taught us is that no explorer has ever truly discovered a new world. The new world was already ancient before we ever got there. And as we gaze at it in wild surmise, we cannot possibly guess whose face we will find gazing back at us. Ladies and gentlemen, Jamaica Kincaid.
Thank you very much uh, for that wonderful, generous introduction. Thank you for coming um, here uh, on such a night. Well, it's not very bad, but it's not palm trees either. Um, This is just the moment where I think the evening should end, um, because it's been all glorious until right now, for me. Uh, but I will press on. Um, the, uh, the title uh, of, of my talk is reading and uh, reading and growing up under colonial rule, and I could give you a very straight lecture about it. But as I was saying today, I don't like to do that so much because I feel as if uh, impl implicit in a lecture is. Um, I'm using it in the, the, the word in a domestic sense. I think implicit in a lecture is um, uh, an admission that you have done something wrong and I tell you how to correct yourself. And, um, and the only wrong thing you really have done is to allow me to enter into um, your space. And I, I, I thank you very much for, for this privilege. Um, it occurred to me today when I was talking to some students uh, that um, the notion, or not, not because they were unfamiliar with this idea, but that we Americans um, uh, uh, don't really um, admit the colonial um, world in our daily consciousness, we think of it as something we have liberated ourselves from hundreds of years, a couple of hundreds of years ago, that there was colonial life and we've passed through it and it's really just associated with um, people in funny clothes um, on 4th of July. Uh, but for someone like me, um, the notion of, the, of a colonial world uh, was the, the only world I knew uh, as a child, and I thought it would last forever, um, but all children do, I suppose, think everything will last forever. Uh, but I not only uh, thought it had, would last forever, I thought it had always existed, that, there, uh, that all of human history really led up to this moment in which I live, the colonial world. And uh, actually, by the time I was growing up, uh, the, colonial, the British colonial world was at an end, um, but no one told us uh, uh, that, <laughs> that it had ended. Um, actually, even more significant, the colonial world that I'm talking about was primarily centered in Queen Victoria's reign and um, we, we knew she had died because there were other people who came after her, um, obviously, the latest one being Queen Elizabeth. So clearly Queen Victoria had died, but it didn't really, she hadn't died in the way ordinary people died. We still celebrated her birthday. And uh, her birthday was May 24th, and all my growing up, uh, I was sorry that I was born a day later, not, uh, I was born May 25th not May 24th, and I always, in some way, wondered why my mother hadn't given birth to me on Queen Victoria's birthday, so that I too could be um, uh, in, that, in a golden circle. Uh, so anyway, um, what I'm about to, to talk to you about, this colonial uh, experience and how it made me into a writer, um, I will do through a series of vignettes. I think that's a word. Hmm. 
I know it's a word, but that my life could be presented in vignettes is rather. Um, uh, my mother wouldn't have liked that at all. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to tell it to you in, 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 in um, uh, vignettes. Now, uh, primarily, for, you will see for my own peculiar uh, reasons or by peculiar existence, I constructed early on a world um, from words. I, uh, to show you how the, um, a, a more contemporary, maybe modern um, example of this, I once uh, was asked by a psychiatrist to um, make a picture of my family, draw a picture of my family, and I can't draw at all. I cannot, I simply cannot draw anything except in the crudest, most primitive kind of drawing. And I made a, uh, stick figure drawings of everyone in my family. Uh, and the last figure was, would be myself. But when I came to draw myself, I couldn't do anything but make a representation um, of a head. And the psychiatrist's interpretation was that I had uh, obviously arrested development uh, um, emotionally because I could only draw stick figures as an adult and also that um, uh, I could only draw myself as a head, I had no body. And that made perfect sense to me uh, because except I'm very vain, um, and so therefore like the idea of having a body when I'm standing in front of you, but when I'm alone, I don't really care if I have a body, but I really, really want to have a head. Uh, so, this is it. This is the, the beginning of the vignettes. Um, From to, to a couple of things. Um, I was always told that I could uh, talk before I could walk. Um, uh, uh, the, uh, among the earliest things I can remember my mother telling me um, is that I could talk before I could walk. The other thing she said uh, is that she had to um, stop nursing me because I had um, she, I had exhausted her. She had no, I had nursed her dry, that she had no more milk to give me. And um, I really did believe that. And it was, uh, she told it to me as, as if it made me extraordinary, that this was um, unheard of, that a child, you know, a baby could exhaust the, the mother's milk. And I really believed it, and I, it added to my own sense of my specialness. Um, I grew up thinking I was very special, and you'll see um, um, why. Of course, only much later, as I became a mother myself, I realized that this was impossible uh, to, for a baby to nurse uh, uh, someone dry. The other thing is um, uh, that I, even at an early age, I listened a lot to what was being said. Um, not so that I could f obey uh, a rule, but I listened because I liked what people said. I liked to, s to hear what they were, were talking about. And uh, then very early on, I developed this, what, what they called a fantastic memory. Uh, my family said I had a wonderful memory because I would just remember, often I remembered things that they uh, uh, didn't. And at first the things I remembered um, were good things, you know, if, some, if something wonderful had happened, uh, you know, in my childish way, very small childish way, I would remember how it had happened. And everyone would, especially my mother, would say admiringly what a wonderful memory I had. And if you know anything about children, if you praise them for something, they will do it even more. So. I had this wonderful memory, I was told, and I remembered more and more things. But eventually, I remembered things that no one wanted to remember. And so this, uh, um, 
uh, attribute uh, that would earn me such praise, uh, and it would go like this for, uh, in the first instance. What a memory you have, admiringly, and then with incredible denunciation, scorn, I would be told, what a memory you have, as if it should be thrown away, it was as if it was a great flaw, this memory um, I had. So eventually uh, I began to not speak at all. I only kept the memories uh, of how what really happened to myself, um, which is how I began to write much later. But here are some things. I was born on a small island on a Wednesday morning in May of 1949. This fact, this Wednesday that I was born on, was always told uh, that I was a child of woe. And this was really stressed to me uh, uh, that I was born on Wednesday and I was a child of woe. The part of the woe uh, was associated with, again, this fact of my remembering, and I would remember, uh, as I say, sad things, and, or, or would just remember things. But the, the things um, uh, that I talked about from memory, as I say, were things that people didn't want to remember, and they were usually sad things or bad things, and they, uh, um, I was, they were associated with this day I was born on, um, Wednesday. Uh, so that's a, a whole idea that shapes me um, early on. Uh, the other thing, my mother read a great deal and this was unusual from her, for a woman of her background. She was poor, and, uh, but educated, and again, very unusual that her father uh, educated her, sent her to school in Rosso Dominica. Um, her father was well off himself. Uh, he was a policeman, and um, a policeman in those days in a, on a small island uh, uh, could have influence, and he did. He was also, his influence came from um, being um, a thief, a corrupt man. Um, uh, her life, a woman in her position, uh, is usually made up of work, household duties, taking care of children, taking care of her husband, the usual things. She did all that, and then she read a great deal. She read mostly nonfiction or so I remember, and uh, among the things I remember her reading were A, a Life of Beethoven and uh, A Life of uh, Louis Pasteur. And I particularly remember the Louis Pasteur because um, I asked her what, it, what the Louis Pasteur was, and she explained to me that it was from him, uh, the reason she boiled my milk, um, not the milk from her breast, but the milk from her cow, uh, is uh, to pasteurize it, and that this whole idea of pasteurizing came from Louis Pasteur. And I do remember uh, that whole notion of a person's name being associated with a process that they're responsible uh, for um, resonates. Um, I, do, I do remember that it, that it resonated then, though I had no uh, way, of course, of making any use of it. But here is how uh, it comes in later. I've since, in my adult life, become a gardener. And uh, it, a couple of reasons why this is um, what I'm about to tell you is, is easy for me. Um, I loved botany as a child, and I love, so because I love botany as a child, I've since come to love and know plants, and I know very much, can retain very well, uh, the proper names of plants. Often the proper names of plants have to do with the proper name of someone. A lot of plants are named in honor of someone. Uh, and the honor 
usually has great political uh, um, implications. So that um, a German doctor named von Siebold went to Japan. I'm diver digressing a little bit, but it's important. It relates to the Pasteur. A German doctor named von Siebold, um, representing the Dutch East India Company in the 19th century, was in Japan. And uh, while representing the Dutch East India Company, he had an affair, um, married, all right, so to speak, a Japanese woman, and they had a daughter who I think became the first woman doctor, or maybe the first woman ophthalmologist in Japan. In any case, eventually the Dutch East India Company was expelled from Japan, and he returned with a lot of plants from Japan. Uh, all of these plants were given his name, so see bold, so that you people in the uh, audience who are gardeners, if you ever plant Hosta Siboldiana, it's for him that it's named. Uh, but all, when you hear the name Siboldiana attached to a plant, it means the plant is native to Japan. Uh, even the Japanese have to call all these plants that are named Siboldiana, uh, Sibold. Uh, they have to they have to honor the sea bold and I know that my attachment to that sort of thing to knowing the names of uh, uh, to to recognizing and to find significance in the names of things and that they are named for someone has to do with that moment when my mother explained pasteurization and Louis Pasteur to me uh, uh, from my mother being a reader, a reader comes this again. Because I used to interrupt her reading with questions, really just generally wanting her attention, she decided to teach me to read. I believe she thought, I believe her reasoning really, was that if I could become preoccupied with my own books, I would leave her alone with hers. Uh, and she turned out to be right. What would happen is that she would, uh, since I was an only child, and she was in this uh, complicated um, moment of her life of wanting to be a good mother, or wanting to distinguish herself from the the other people she knew who were in her class. And uh, one of the ways she could do it apart from reading was to make a treasure of her child. I come from a place where children are not treasured, but they are um, little entities in which to play out the colonial master narrative, the colonized and master narrative, so that a child is often treated. The the uh, relationship between a, a parent and a child uh, replicates the relationship between the mother country or the fatherland and the colony. Uh, but I didn't have that um, relationship uh, early on in my life with my mother. Um, I had more the sort of privileged uh, contemporary relationship. Um, so anyway, as I say, she turned out to be right, and uh, by the time I was three and a half years old, I could read. I, I can't exactly remember the process, the, the, the actual process of learning ABC, uh, my ABCs and so on, and learning to spell little words. So I can't remember the, the process um, through which this happened, but I can remember that the minute I was shown a, uh, the words in a book, and they must have been a child's book, that the words leapt up to me, that there was no effort at all in learning to read. I just knew how to do it, that once I, I mastered, and I, there must have been a process, a time when it was foreign to me, the, the idea of these words on the page. Um, but I don't remember it so. I just remember that once um, my mother showed it to me that there was some 
invisible bond between the words on the page and me, and that um, I've never lost it. Uh, I knew how to read by the time I was three and a half years of age quite well, so much so that I began uh, uh, to give my mother trouble again, that in, in, in fact the uh, reading was, to, was supposed to solve a problem um, with me, but instead it created a larger problem because I became even more disruptive to my mother. And so she decided to put me in school. Uh, now I can date this moment of putting me, uh, I, can, I, I can associate a significant um, uh, event in, uh, uh, attached to writing with it. I was three and a half years of age, but I was not to go to school, you're not allowed to go to school until you're five. You're not allowed to go to proper school. You, can, you could have gone to you know, a creche or a little play group or something, um, but you couldn't officially be put in school until you were five. Uh, but I could read so well and could understand all sorts of things so well that my mother put me in school and she said to me, and this is my first association with writing and fiction uh, or dissimulation, she said to me, now remember if they ask you to say you are five. And we practiced it all the time uh, because at, at the same time I was told that to lie was a mortal sin, that you couldn't trust anyone who lied and I must never lie, that it was, um, I would be sent to hell if I lied. On the other hand, I must say that I'm five when I'm three and a half years old. So I would, uh, I have to say that that is my first uh, foray into um, ambiguity, uh, um, duplicity, uh, really into sin, but uh, well, I did go to school and I excelled because, again, and, and only in this one area, which was very important uh, in my education, I excelled at reading. I always could read. I always understood what I read. I read obsessively uh, everything I could. And... Um, but everything I had to read was, uh, was very limited, so I would quickly use up all the things that there were to read or, or would quickly do my work in school and um, afterwards would get in trouble because there was nothing else for me to do. And again, the problem of the relationship with my mother and, and not allowing her to read her books would recur, but in a different way, uh, that um, to occupy me, what to do, with me once I had used up all the things that were available to me um, is a, a continue, continued throughout my childhood, that, that problem. Uh, another significant thing in the reading um, and the colonial experience, we had one book uh, that I knew how to read backwards and forwards um, but here is what interested me about it, but I had no, no way to put it in any context at all. How could I? Uh, we had a book. First of all, we had a wonderful teacher named Miss Tanner, and she had an enormous bottom. Um, it probably wasn't that enormous, but for us children it was, and it became uh, a feature of our daily school life. Uh, for, uh, and it wasn't just us, but it, it had, in fact what I'm about to tell you was handed down to us. She was um, what you would call fat or large or something, but all of the largeness of her was in her bottom. And it made it hard for her to walk easily. Uh, a common thing uh, for us children was to pinch her bottom and then look innocent. 
so by the time she turned around, we were composed into angelic um, poses, and she never could figure out who had pinched her bottom. And generations of us called her Muddy Bottom Tanner. It's just the sort of thing um, school children do. And um, uh, uh, it was you know, part of our uh, fun at school. Um, with her, I learned uh, another a level of reading, or I got to another level of reading, and um, had this book. I cannot remember the name of the book, but here is what the book was about. It was about a farmer. He had no wife. His name was Mr. Joe. He lived on a farm with his dog named Mr. Dan. He had a cat named Miss Tibbs, and he had a cow, but she had no name. He had a hen, and she had 12 chicks. Eleven of the chicks were golden little chicks, all uniform. One chick was larger, bigger, and the chick, that chick was a boy, and he was all black. His name was Percy, and he was always getting in trouble. One of the things he wanted to do, Percy, was to fly up on the fence, and his mother, Mother Hen, would always say to him, Percy, don't do that. She was always telling him not to do something that he wanted to do. And inevitably, he would get in trouble. I can't remember all, any other trouble he got involved in, except this one bit of trouble. He wanted to fly upon the fence. And uh, his mother kept saying, Percy, don't do that. Uh, he couldn't. Um, uh, he never succeeded on... Uh, on landing on the fence, except this one time when he did land on the fence, and then he fell down and broke his leg. And the sentence that accompanies this event is, Percy the chick had a fall. Let me go back and uh, give you this picture. Uh, because I, must, I was about five when I first read that. I understood it two years later when I was seven, and I'll tell you how. But let me go back and show you this picture. There's mother hen with 12 chicks. 11 are yellow, beautiful, perfect chicks. Percy is bigger, male, He's all black feathered. All his feathers are black. He's distinctive in that way. But Mother Hen is not described as having 11 chicks and Percy. Mother Hen has 12 chicks. 11 of them are yellow, and then there's Percy who isn't yellow. Percy is the transgressor, always. He flies up on the fence falls down, breaks his leg, and the sentence is, Percy the chick had a fall. I remembered it, but I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't even know that it was possible to do something with it. But perhaps two years later, I was seven when this happened, uh, I cannot remember what it is I did wrong. And there are many things I did wrong my entire school career in, uh, at that point, up to the time I was 16. Um, my school career was filled with things I did wrong. I cannot remember what it is I did wrong when I was seven, but the punishment was... I had to copy books one and two of Paradise Lost. <laughs> the copy of Paradise Lost that I had, uh, oh, that I was given to copy uh, the two books, um, and I had to do this overnight. 
uh, I grew up in a place in, uh, at that time we had no indoor plumbing or electricity, so this had to be done by lamplight or in the dark. Um, and, uh, but I did it. Anyway, I did it. Uh, I, I completed the assignment, or I don't know what would have happened uh, uh, to me. In any case, this copy of Paradise Lost that I had had a, uh, a, a picture, um, uh, um, not lithograph, a woodcut of, I think, a print of um, uh, the fallen prince uh, standing on a charred globe defiantly, one foot on the globe, he's balanced on it, very balletic and uh, he's brandishing um, a sword, and his hair uh, was all snakes, and the snakes looked as if they were about to strike. This beautiful picture. Um, very, just a, a, a beautiful picture. In any case, at seven, I identified Percy the Chick having a fall with that image and with those, with what I had just copied. I can't tell you that I understood Paradise Lost, the first two books, or any of Paradise Lost at seven at all, but I knew there was something in it that I should not resist, and I knew that it belonged with the sentence and with the image of Percy the Chick had a fall. Um... Another event with literature. Among the things that will uh, occur in a colonial person's life is that all the natural affection and affiliations they will want to have with their ancestry, their natural history, their surroundings. They are not allowed to do that. This is, uh, would be uh, pointed out to them as a lesser, a lesser version or uh, inferior version, really, um, to the ruling narrative. So that I, for instance, considered myself um, unlucky to have been born in a place where the seasons never changed. This paradise, this, this place that people go to, I was born in a place that people go to to escape what you have out here. I considered it a curse that I had only summer, that I did not have a four seasons. The idea of living in a place with four seasons, that seemed to me to be a sign of chosen by God to be given uh, uh, four seasons, as opposed to be being born in one season, um, uh, that seemed a curse. This is how the colonial narrative works. It inverts your reality, that when you're a conquered person, your own reality is presented to you as inferior, and you long for the narrative that has conquered you. I think it's pointed out that the only time this has not been true is with the, uh, when the Romans conquered the Greeks. Uh, they just adopted the Greeks. They didn't um, impose their um, narrative on the Greeks. They just took it. I think everybody agrees, or most people I've read say that's the only time that's ever happened. Usually, when you are conquered, uh, the conquering narrative becomes the superior narrative and the one you long for. Um, a contemporary way, I mean, I, I digress, but just want to show you, a contemporary way it works is that if you go um, to the southwest where there are people of Spanish heritage, and by Spanish heritage I mean in the way when you go to New England you see people who can uh, trace their heritage to England, um, mostly England is new. New England is very New Englandy, and um, most of the people who go back 
uh, you know, who are there will say, oh, you know, if they, they are um, the Pembrokes, for instance, my neighbors, they're from England, my neighbors in Vermont, um, they can trace their ancestry. But in, in New Mexico or places like that, there are people who can tra trace their ancestry to the settlers from Spain. But because Spain is defeated, um, uh, Spanish people of Spanish heritage become Hispanic. And the Hispanic narrative is a narrative that we don't feel is the equal, and I say we, it's um, uh, not the equal to the Atlantic uh, um, English narrative. That um, feeling of Hispanic being his inferior and that, um, you know, including, say, in the concept of Hispanic, um, we have uh, people from Puerto Rico, people from Cuba, people from Argentina, people from Mexico, people, we say Hispanic and you know, we don't know what to do with it. It's, it's, you know, funny. It's not English. It's not Scottish. It's not Irish. It's Hispanic. And it comes from uh, their defeat. It comes from, you can, and you can tr trace the beginning of it, the racialization, so to speak, of uh, this group of people called Hispanic. I think you can trace it to the Abada, the defeat of, um, that the British imposed on the Spanish uh, in the Amada. Am I speaking um, so widely historical that it's, uh, um, it's non-Jew? Well, it, I'm sorry? That's right. Okay, I'll go on. Okay. Um, thank you. Did you look it up on your iPhone? <laughs> I've seen that commercial. <laughs> um, but to go back to telling you how these things work, the, how, how uh, people who are uh, subjugated, their reality, um, uh, becomes an inferior one. Their narrative becomes an inferior one, and they um, often make a great effort to forget it and to, because who wants to be defeated, really? Nobody. Everybody wants to rule. Uh, though more and more the world gets so that there isn't anybody to rule anymore. Everybody wants to rule, so nobody gets to rule. Um, uh, but in any case, to, to go back to how uh, so my surroundings were, I'm tr trying to keep track here, um, my surroundings, my vegetable surroundings, my, the very climate I grew up in was, um, I made, uh, I thought it was um, uh, inferior. That, for instance, a real flower was not a hibiscus, a real flower would be delphiniums, something that will not grow in the West Indies, um, or foxgloves. I particularly loved the idea of foxgloves. I have never seen, I had never seen one until I was about 25 years, but I, I knew very well all sorts of things about foxgloves. Um, I had a crisis when I was about 10 years old because I would not recite Wordsworth, I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud. Uh, I had just a violent um, feeling, and, I'd, and I must say to you, uh, I sound like an awfully sophisticated uh, uh, child. I wasn't at all. These were all feelings I had, and I cannot tell exactly where they come from, these feelings of resisting uh, uh, and identifying with transgressive images, um, except to say that I had a very intelligent and politically um, engaged, I don't want to say aware, engaged mother. And so it might have been from her without remembering exactly. But I did not want to uh, recite this poem. I memorized it, but I didn't want to recite it because I thought, but I would never see, I've never seen a daffodil. What is a daffodil? 
Uh, I should tell you that I have since redeemed uh, Wordsworth from this awful enterprise of conquering um, by planting 10,000 daffodils on my lawn in Vermont. <laughs> so Wordsworth is no longer in the narrative of my subjugation. Uh, on the other hand, and this is the real complication for people like me, I would not be able to speak to you without these things. And here is something. Again, to keep me quiet or to punish me, it was actually more, it's a combination of both. I was misbehaving in my French class and my French teacher, who later became an executive at West Indies Oil, <laughs> I reminded him of this when I met him later, uh, but he didn't remember, he actually uh, didn't remember how he despised me as a, a student <laughs> and because um, I was always getting, as I say, in trouble. He didn't remember despising me at all. He was only proud of me when we met again. But I remembered very well that he was very harsh to me and a, as a part of his harshness, uh, when I was misbehaving, he put me in a corner and he said, here, read this. And I was about 10 or 11, and the book he gave to me was Jane Eyre. That book, if you want to say change your life, I was not the same after I read it, because I then entered into, and it coincided with hormones and so on, I then entered into um, a period of pretending I was a writer, even though I had no idea what this would be. Uh, but I would pretend I was Charlotte Bronte, and I had read, uh, I think, on the flap of the book that she had lived in Belgium and was all alone and was um, a nanny um, or nurse maid. And I would pretend that in this hot climate, I would pretend that I was Charlotte Bronte and I was shivering and hungry um, in Belgium. She lived in Belgium. And I actually wrote a story, uh, a chapter of a novel um, in one of my novels called Somewhere Belgium, because it didn't say where she was in Belgium, just that she was in Belgium. And so I became, um, at 11, a starving writer in Belgium, but only I was in uh, a place just above the equator. Um, I'm going to wrap it up, or I'll keep you here forever, uh, by telling you um, There are many things I could read to you, but I, I'm going to... Uh... show you one other... Uh, one other idea of... Um, my mother and writing and my tran the colonial enterprise. Uh, when I was about, this would have been when I was about nine, that my second brother, my first brother was born when I was nine, and I resented him very much. And one day, by accident, I dropped him on his head. <laughs> my parents immediately or so it seems to me, uh, immediately put me on a ship to live with my mother's family in Dominica. And this ship had all sorts of, uh, in this little ship, which was a postal ship, it took letters through the West Indies uh, from one British island to the next. And it would arrive in Antigua, I think, every other Wednesday or something like that. Um, 
Always when the MVP Ripon, as it was called, came, it, it had letters or something from my mother's family, and my mother and her family quarreled all the time and through letters, and they would write the most incredible, uh, hateful things uh, to each other. And again, I must say that for people of their background, this was very unusual. But so in any case, this boat had uh, lots of um, feelings for me. Uh, I had lots of feelings about it. It was as if when it uh, arrived in port, uh, whenever it did, out would fly all sorts of demons that I didn't understand. Well, after uh, I dropped my brother um, on his head, I was put on the MVP Ripon to arrive at the other end, and when it opened, I must have seemed like another one of the many um, combustions, you know, that they can... Uh, exchanged with each other. Uh, Dominica is a very unusual island. It's volcanic, and um, don't be surprised if it's sitting on some fault line that no one has ever heard of, and it does something uh, uh, soon. In any case, when I got to this place, there was no one to greet me. My aunt either hadn't received the letter, uh, but there was no one to greet me. Um, and the captain had to put me uh, on, in a car which took me to Dominica, uh, uh, to Maho, a place uh, um, that I'd only heard of as a kind of story uh, where my mother uh, and her family, where my mother grew up and where her, her, um, her family lived. Uh, I so hated it uh, because I was um, homesick, it was a, uh, it, for one thing, it rained all the time, and I had never seen rain. In Antigua, where I grew up, it didn't rain at all. I'd never seen rain, and this place, it rained nine months of the year. Um, I began to write imaginary letters uh, to my mother, and then I would write letters to my mother. Those were not imaginary. The one, there were imaginary letters, and then there were um, actual letters. But I never posted them. I would put them on the, um, a stone uh, to be, and uh, there were quite a few. Uh, one day, my aunt followed me and saw me going about my business with the stone, and. Uh, she looked under the stone and found um, these letters in which, which I said to my mother that my aunt, whom she hated, was um, awful to me and was mistreating me and um, didn't love me at all and uh, how much I missed my mother. My aunt, when she saw these letters, uh, flew into a rage and put me on the next ship MVP Ripon back to my mother. And I date that as the first incident of me using writing to change my situation. Thank you. <laughs> I think you are now to ask me questions, but don't feel you have to. I'll answer them. But um, if you feel you have no questions, uh, don't feel you have to. I won't be insulted at all. You've been very gracious. But if there's anything I've said that is unclear and you'd like me to clarify, um, I, I, I will say one thing um, more um, when I'm thinking about America as an empire and, and so on. Um, the one thing America as an empire uh, doesn't do is be responsible uh, for the people it rules over, it dominates. Um, it's, it doesn't bear any responsibility for them, and it doesn't feel it has to impose American culture. American culture gets dispersed. Um, anyway, it might feel it has to impose democracy or what it calls democracy in other people, but the other people know that American democracy only serves America.
So it's in that way um, the American enterprise of empire is different. Hi. Hi. Um, I was introduced to you when I returned to Trinidad, uh, having left there when I was five years old. I just went back two years ago. And I was speaking with a gentleman, and it turned out that everyone there is political. Everybody talks politics. And the next day, he brought me a book, A Small Place. Yes. And I wanted to know, in that book, you talk about when people throw off slavery and they throw off the yoke. I'm sorry, speak. I, li- I oh, can't hear okay. you so well. Okay. When people stop being slaves and yes. they stop being masters, they just become human beings. And I was wondering what your thoughts are of those who become human beings because in my family, in Trinidad, yes. there are people who despise and deplore the colonial history and yet have a great nostalgia for that colonialism. And I was just wondering why you thought that was. Oh, yeah. I think what they have a great nostalgia for is the smoothness with which certain civil institutions worked. Um, For instance, the schools uh, were, the buildings were better or something like that. The roads were better. Um, Hospital, civil institutions in in the colonies worked better than they do in independence. There's something strange that happens uh, to people who had been conquered after they liberate themselves. They seem to remember or to um, duplicate, replicate only the bad parts of the colonial uh, enterprise so that they never seem to Um, remember that uh, the colonial people would put on Gilbert and Sullivan, for instance, or they would um, have a visiting day at the hospital, you know, that things were orderly and there was a certain pride in the way civil society worked. They don't remember that. They only remember uh, the brutality and... um, the injustices, that's what they think the colonial enterprise was about. And I don't understand why that's true. Um, I was driving through the Navajo reservation, and this probably isn't something I should say, Um, and I'm sure there's a very good reason for all this gambling on Indian reservations, but it occurred to me that somewhere in in this uh, memory of Native people to Europeans is that they must have thought, well, these people gambled on coming here. That's the only explanation I can have for why there's so much gam- why gambling seems to be um, so per- per- uh, pervasive in among native people, and I thought, well, maybe they think uh, it was a gamble that life that gambling is. Um, uh, but anyway, it seems to me that uh, people who have been subjugated once they are free to act, they seem to adopt um, a weird part of the culture that had conquered them. Um, You know, you would never know if you went to any of the former British places that there were some good things, one or two, about British people. Not British rule, just British people that, you know, they had... um, they had some good things. Um, you'd never know that. Certainly where I come from, you'd never know that. So it's not nostalgia for colonial rule. It's perhaps nostalgia for some things running well. Um, that's what I think. We have a question over here. Where are you? Here. Oh, yes, yes. Hi, Ms. Kincaid. We're currently in a literature class right now, and we came across your short story, Girl. Yes. I don't mean to bring up bad times, but was that an an actual, thanks. Was that an actual um, conversation between you and your mother? Um, Not a conversation. Uh, um, That is uh, a litany of things 
that were said to me, but it's not that they were said. What they were meant to do was to shape uh, a life, to give it order, uh, to give it a way of surviving um, in a world. It, so the, it wasn't a conversation. And um, the girl's retort, which is in italics, um, uh, the reason it's in italics is that she would never have voiced a response to any of the things said to, to her. Um, so it's not a conversation. It's a, you know, it's like a mold. It's as if uh, uh, the words form a, a mold in which the girl is poured and eventually would become the sort of person who um, the mother desired. Um, yeah. So it's not, it's not a conversation. Thank you for clearing that up. Thank you. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for sharing very candidly your experience of growing up in your home country. Um, as someone who is very interested in uh, post-colonial literature and the studies, um, I I just have a quick uh, thought while you were talking that, um, that, that your talk reminds me of uh, what Apia uh, says in his very, I think, very uh, well-written article. Uh, is the postmodern the, the same as the postcolonial in the postcolonialism in which he uh, kind of very usefully maps out three generations of African authors, uh, naming Achebe as the first one, uh, representative of uh, a very nostalgic desire for the return, uh, for some kind of cultural authenticity and the roots. And then uh, Soli Winka as the uh, representative of the second generation, and then goes on to uh, label um, J.M. Kutsi, which uh, who is my favorite author. Yes. I wonder um, if you think this parallel or this mapping of the uh, three African generations also applies to other uh, colonial and post-colonial authors. And then going from there, uh, I, I wonder if you could elaborate on what you uh, mentioned briefly during our conversation at uh, the reception the meaning of the metaphor of you see the ways in which you see uh, colonialism as a metaphor. Mm. Um, uh, to go to the first one, I think it's significant and even interesting that um, Anthony, uh, Professor Apia, um, mentions three men. There are African women writers. Nadim Godema would be, um, you would say, uh, um, uh, the equivalent, uh, well, she's the generation of Achebe. Um, uh, but it's a, a peculiar thing, and I wonder if anyone has said this to Anthony, that um, are there no women who would represent uh, um, any of the generations? Um, in our case, in the, in the West Indies, uh, the British uh, West Indies, um, when I first started to write, the only, all, I have an anthology of um, West Indian writers and there are no women in it at all. Um, we don't have as being little islands and being, um, you know, really, uh, holiday material, vacation material. And, um, we don't have a substantial a tradition. Ours is more fractured than, a, than the Africans. Um, but uh, when I started to write, I think the women writers of note of int with um, substantial reputation were two Dominicans and they were white, what you'd call white. Um, people, Jean Rees and Phyllis um, Alfrey. Uh, they were writing, and we, the women in the, in the West Indies, we tend to write about a more domestic situation. Um, so 
uh, I think our cha um, Anthony Appiah's analysis wouldn't um, apply to us. Uh, I think that um, I might have been, um, oh, I don't know if you want to say the first or anything like that, but uh, I, I, I think I must have been among the first to write about the relationship between the domestic, the mother-daughter, and the world. Uh, but whether my situation represents um, anything uh, national, any, any cultural uh, um, significance in the West Indies, I don't know. Uh, I know... Um, I know I was the f uh, among the first, anyway, among the earliest, I should say, um, women to, to write about, in, in English, uh, to write about the effects of the colonial enterprise on, on us. Um, but as I, I have pointed out, uh, oh, I think I did, or maybe it was to an earlier group, I had an interesting uh, mother, and it's um, from her uh, that I get um, this desire, really, to make a connection between the world, the larger world, and our tiny home. And it's from her that I noticed that her behavior, she was such an imperious person, that her behavior mimicked, um, and it, uh, mimicked the, the center of the empire, and that I was sort of like a little satellite controlled by the sun, which is the mother country. Um, I don't think uh, uh, Walk was uh, the big writers uh, of real international prominence, Derek Walcott and um, and and V. S. Naipaul. Uh, Africa, I don't think, has a Naipaul. Naipaul, um, V. S. Naipaul is a great writer, um, possibly a vile person. Uh, I think he would say he's a vile person. You should read a biography of him. Um, I think he agrees he's a vile person, but he's a great writer. And we are just, we should just count ourselves lucky that we will never have to be his wife. Um, but in the English, yeah, the two great writers in the English world, um, English speaking Caribbean, Naipaul Walcott. Um, and the ones alive anyway, there's C.L.R. James, he's dead. And there are probably other people, I'm, yes, Brathwaite. The, the, for me, the two great ones are, who are alive are Walcott and, and, um, uh, and, and Naipaul um, in the English-speaking world. Brathwaite I'm not such a fan of um, uh, uh, because I'm not a... And nationalists. So I actually don't believe in cultural integrity and so on. I think you do what you do. I don't think there's any such thing. Cultural integrity is where you begin to get into big trouble. So, is there. Oh, we have time for one or two more. But if there isn't one or two more, uh, yes. Oh, absolutely. Uh, delphiniums are hard to grow, and I have on and off success. They're very temperamental, unless they're species ones. Um, but the ones in a, um, the hybrid ones are very hard. They're very temperamental, and they don't, they're not long-lived. Uh, but um, I grow species ones from China, where I've collected them. Uh, the, you know, <laughs> I, I have to confess to you that I have become in my own, uh, involved in my own imperial um, endeavor. I um, go on something called plant hunting, and there is almost nothing. It's the most benign of, uh, I have to say, of um, conquests is plant, uh, plant collecting, and I have been involved in that, and I go off sometimes to uh, parts of the world where I have no business being that sort of person, um, 
and collect uh, things, uh, seeds for things that I grow in, in, in my garden in Vermont. Um, one thing I will tell you about it, and it really, really confounds, um, you know, any notion you have of uh, limiting hu human curiosity or human desire. I was in Nepal uh, looking for things to grow in my garden, and uh, we were looking for a certain viburnum, which we couldn't find anywhere, and my friends thought, well, it doesn't, you know, it's not in seed or something, and we were in despair and we're going to move on. And just as we were about to move on, we saw this plant, this viburnum, um, on a man's back, it was fodder for his animals, this particular viburnum, that's a treasure for us. Right in that area, in gardens that the Nepalese cultivate, their treasured plants were native to Mexico. They were growing marigolds and um, Brugman, some brugmansia, uh, um, dahlias, things that we care nothing about, just grow in a pot, throw away. That was a treasure for them. While we were in their neighborhood looking for treasures for our garden. So, despair, thy name is what you don't have, you want. Thank you.